Bonjour. Comme vous savez, un des sujets très en vogue, en vogue ici, c'est celui des, des titrats. Donc aujourd'hui, on a le plaisir d'accueillir quelqu'un qui a en fait eu beaucoup de contributions au domaine des titrats, que ce soit dans les zones de densité de charge, avec des mesures de test CY, de pouvoir thermoélectrique. Mais euh, il y a quelque chose de plus général, qui est ce qu'on appelle le métal étrange, qui apparaît non seulement dans les titrates, mais dans plein d'autres euh, composés. Donc, euh, euh, Amir Reza a euh, gentiment accepté à la dernière minute de faire cette présentation, qui était une présentation invitée à, à l'APS, qui n'a malheureusement pas pu faire à cause de, des problèmes de visa. Donc, on lui donne une opportunité de, de la faire, disons, pas dans un, un auditoire aussi large, mais un auditoire aussi euh, prestigieux, disons. Ah. <rire> merci, merci. Voilà. Alors, accueillir, accueillir Amir Reza à terre. Hein? Merci. Bonjour, merci. Merci beaucoup, uh, André-Marie, pour l'invitation. En fait, pour mon talk uh, de pièce Gaël. Gaël fait ça à ma place. Donc, il a gentiment accepté de faire ma présentation à IPS. Uh, Est-ce que vous m'entendez bien? C'est correct? OK. Parfait. Uh, hi, everyone. So, uh, today, I would like to talk about uh, Planckian dissipation, uh, the field dependence of Planckian dissipation, and strange methods. So this is the outline of my talk. I would like to answer to five questions. Uh, so first, I would like to discuss what is the significance of studying high temperature superconductors. So I try to lean back a little bit. I know it's not very easy to do so in, at IQ, but I would like to give you a bigger perspective about uh, the research, the significance of research in high TC superconductors. Then I would like to talk about strange metals and uh, how we are doing that, how we do these kind of measurements, how we have carried out high field measurements at Toulouse. And uh, so then what we can learn about that. And in the end, I'm gonna address some of the open questions. So first I would like to start with very uh, general perspective. Uh, Creative solutions in science in general can be categorized, uh, can be classified into four categories. So first uh, is integration. You can think about things that look different, but they are the same. So for example, you can use same kind of medications for uh, viruses, for uh, diseases that appear to be different. Another one is about separation. So things that are believed to be the same, but they are actually different. And the one example of that is the periodic table of elements or a different kind of materials, categorization of insulators, metals, and so on. Another one is about figure ground reversal. So for this class of uh, scientific solutions, actually the solution itself and the useful solution is to be found in the background, not in the foreground. One example is GPS. So for example, GPS uh, at the beginning, it was developed to track a satellite, but then in the end, the application reversed and it was used to uh, track us with two satellites. Uh, another example could be a Slack, for example, that was first developed for uh, in-house messaging app and then the application uh, reversed. And finally, we are talking about, we can uh, think about digital uh, thinking. So the innovative solutions that are completely outside the box. One example is VCS theory and so on. So I have seen this kind of trend, this kind of thinking, this kind of creative solution that happens again and again in the study of uh, high temperature superconductors. So for example, there are, uh, this is a typical phase diagram of uh, high temperature superconductors. There are different electronic symmetry breaking phases, uh, strange metal that I'm going to talk about today, charge density wave, pseudo gap, superconductivity, and so on. So uh, there are many different avenues of research that tries to integrate that, for example, pseudo gap and charge density wave might be in the end the same thing or separate them, you know, that these phases are distinct. There have been different uh, thinking of figure ground reversal so that people were thinking, okay, maybe the superconductivity was born because of the antiferromagnetic fluctuations because of the pseudo gap phase other theories talking about charge and wave and so on. So this is how I can see the significance of our research and how we are thinking about different type of paradigms, different type of solutions in our field. But in this talk, 
I would like to talk about, I would like to focus on strange metals. And I would, for simplicity reasons and for the interest of time, I would like to focus above uh, the pseudo gap phase at dopings uh, in which we only have superconductivity, strange metals, and at high temperature Fermi liquid phase. So first, uh, let's again, uh, this is a more simplified version of the phase diagram. And let's start with uh, what we consider as a normal metal. So in a normal metal, this is uh, resistivity as a function of temperature for LSCO at high dopings, out, uh, completely outside the pseudo gap phase. This is just a generic phase diagram. So for LSCO, uh, if you want the, the end point of the pseudo gap is at lower dopings. And for NDLSCO, this is at higher dopings. But in the end, the material that I'm talking about, they're outside the pseudo gap phase where you have a quadratic temperature dependence. And at lower dopings, you have uh, linear, we have a linear temperature dependence. So this is uh, what has been uh, uh, known uh, and coined, the term uh, strange metal has been coined for this type of behavior. So this is one of the hallmarks of these materials. And uh, again, uh, these are, so as we can account for the resistivity with Fermi liquid uh, theory, it is called, uh, it is also considered to be normal metals. So then, uh, people are categorizing everything, uh, different metals into three categories, normal, strange, or bad metals. So uh, I don't want to talk about all of the details uh, here, but for uh, specifically for bad metals, the interactions are important. In good metal, the interaction doesn't introduce another, uh, doesn't uh, require a large correction for the scattering rate. However, in bad metals, it is uh, important to consider what is the effect of interactions for the scattering rate. And then uh, these are very, very uh, hand-waving terms still to me, good metal, bad metals, or strange metals. But for the sake of this presentation, I want to tell you what is strange again about these strange metals. So uh, let's think about uh, normal metals. So here, this green curve, shows the resistivity of normal metal as a function of temperature. And you can see perhaps three different uh, behaviors. And in red, this is for, uh, typical resistivity of a strange metal. So at low temperatures, due to electron-electron interaction, and at temperature range that is, again, these are, uh, this is the dy temperature, and these are uh, not exact values, but it's, it works uh, about this temperature. So for temperatures below 0.2 uh, times of the dy temperature, which is significantly lower than the Fermi energy, due to electron-electron interaction, resistivity can be written uh, with this formula. So you have different terms. You have a quadratic term, and you have a, another term with the power of five. That is, uh, this one is related to electron-phonon interactions, and the other one is related to electron-electron interaction. And then at higher temperature, we, uh, due to a uh, MOT IF uh, regal limit, we have saturation. So basically, at low temperature, you have somehow a quadratic, some form of quadratic resistivity. And at high temperature, you have uh, a linear uh, saturation. So in between, we have, it's inevitable to have a linear resistivity. So linear resistivity by itself and in itself, it's not strange. And it, is, it has been seen in many materials. And uh, as you can see, these are uh, very normal uh, metals. And above this range, above uh, 0.2 times the dy temperature, uh, T-linear resistivity has been observed. So this is uh, not uh, significant by itself. This is not, nothing strange about that. The strange things is two things. First, uh, at low temperature, at very uh, relatively low temperature, you have this T-linear resistivity. This is one of the uh, archety one of the characteristics of a strange metal. And another one is that it passes the MOT IF regal limit up to the temperature at which crystal actually starts to melt. So T-linear resistivity at low temperature uh, ranges is uh, strange. And this has been, uh, so before, uh, 
where we were inside the su superconducting phase, it was hard to, it was very speculative to think about the regime of resistivity at low temperature. But after the development of a high field measurements, this uh, part of the phase diagram, the resistivity in this part of the phase diagram and in this uh, temperature range was measured and the perfectly T-linear resistivity was observed. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, Planckian dissipation. So I start with basic uh, Durude formalism. This is the Durude formula. M star is the effective mass. N is the density of carriers. Electron is the, E is the charge of electrons and tau is the scattering rate, scattering time. One over tau is the scattering rate. So uh, in the strange metal phase, one over tau can be written as follows. So uh, alpha times KBT, KB is the Boltzmann constant over H bar. And alpha uh, is constant in many different systems. So uh, again, in uh, strange metals, we have a T-linear resistivity. If you substitute uh, one over tau in this formula, uh, so yeah, we have, so in strange metals, we have T-linear resistivity, as I mentioned. And if you substitute one over tau from this formula in a resistivity, in T-linear resistivity, and calculate the derivative, you have uh, this uh, relation. So if you uh, continue to uh, work out the map, uh, the math, uh, you can uh, see that NE squared times uh, e, NE squared over KBKF times D rho over DT is proportional to alpha over uh, Fermi velocity. This has been uh, observed in many different uh, systems that are not, that are very, very different. But uh, I think it's fair to also uh, mention the recent developments that, uh, in which people measure different systems uh, in which, so different, for example, uh, heavy fermion systems in which they calculated different M star and then they plotted this relation. So this relation is what I uh, worked out here, what I showed you here. Uh, and uh, if you plot it as a function of VF, a Fermi, a Fermi velocity, it previously, all of these materials were uh, lie on this line in which the, the slope is uh, at alpha equal one. But recently there has been other measurements uh, for alpha equal 0.1 in which other materials show uh, different uh, VF, VFS, so different alpha. And uh, yes. So the question was that, uh, why there are some points in these diagrams for normal metals, such as gold, aluminum, and copper. And, I, uh, and the answer was that these materials are, they show T-linear resistivity also. Yes, so the question is that for these normal materials, the alpha should depend on uh, the D by temperature. So uh, this is uh, all of these measurements. So uh, they were considered to be uh, done at the regime in which we have T-linear resistivity. So in a given window of temperature where we have T-linear resistivity. So yes, it depends on the DY temperature, but uh, we look at the temperature in which we have T-linear resistivity. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. That, that has been addressed at the March meeting this year. So what they explain is that, so here we talk about strange metals, which is T-linear resistivity in the T equals zero limit. Sure. But indeed, in convention, conventional metals, you can also observe T-linear resistivity, but in a very different regime. So above like half of the divide temperature or something. But the slope, as far as I understand, is that the slope that gives, uh, so for the copper, gold, and whatever, the slope of the resistivity is related to the electron funnel coupling. And in the end here, it's, it's almost a coincidence. I mean, it's like there's no bound on, on alpha. But all metals, as far as I understand, have a, as an electron sum coupling the same order, and that gives you about one. So, so, so that's a very good question because um, in the case of conventional metals, uh, there is no limit on the electron sum uh, scattering. Uh, but uh, what uh, Shaitanya Murthy, uh, a, a postdoc with uh, Steve Kivasunshan at the March meeting, is that if you were to increase the electron sum coupling in, in metals, you will end up with insulators. So at some point, this electron funnel coupling is, is reaching like a, a universal value. I mean, something very common among, among all metals. And that happens, that always gives you about the same slope for all metals. 
but the and then that links to the to the question of the talk is uh, is is this Planckian limit at low temperature in strange metal a real limit, or is it also yeah. a coincidence that it always end up in the in the same order of one value? Uh, I mean that's uh, I don't know if it was very clear, but that's uh, that's a very relevant question. That's okay. okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah, I would be happy to uh, go back to that at the, uh, the end of. If I can make just one more comment, um, but if you see lab. Right, the scale is logarithmic, so uh, <laughs> almost yes, yes. yes. Right. Uh, okay. So yeah, what I wanted to say is that there has been some uh, re more recent measurements uh, that try to put other uh, materials in this phase diagram, but then uh, the deep, uh, there is a larger error bar because me the measurement uh, for uh, calculation of the of M star is more complicated. So uh, this talk, in this talk, I would like to focus on T-linear resistivity that was observed in uh, many different strongly correlated electron systems as a function of different tuning parameters. So one of them would be a uh, field. So temperature, uh, T-linear resistivity was observed as a function of field, as a function of doping in different systems. So these are heavy fermions. This is strontium rutanate, cuprates, uh, recently in a magic, ang magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, uh, T-linear resistivity was observed as a, at particular uh, carrier density. And uh, now there has been uh, different debates uh, in the community that where we have T-linear resistivity in particular. So if you focus on these two uh, tuning parameters, temperature and field where we have observed T-linear resistivity, B-linear resistivity was observed. And with uh, this uh, scaling mechanism, these two can be uh, connected. And uh, in cuprates also, in cuprates in systems uh, in which T-linear resistivity was observed, again, at low temperature, B-linear resistivity was uh, also observed. And now the question uh, that, and uh, it has been, uh, conjecture that T-linear resistivity and B-linear resistivity might be related to one another. So the question that I try to answer is that is B-linear resistivity another facet of T-linear resistivity? And uh, to answer to this question, I'm uh, going to talk about the, uh, how we measure resistivity and how we model resistivity. But first, let's start by our uh, measurement. Uh, this uh, talk is based on uh, our recent paper that was um, it was the fruit of collaboration uh, with uh, University of Sherbrooke. And I would like to highlight uh, the contribution of uh, Adrian Gael. Uh, and also this project was led by Louis Taife with our collaborators at uh, Laboratoire National de Champ Magnetique and Towns at Toulouse uh, with collaboration with uh, Cyril Proust and the samples were provided with, uh, by, uh, by three different groups. So, uh, Again, uh, I remind you that I look at uh, the samples that we measured. I measured three, we measured three samples in this study, all of which are located above the pseudo gap phase where we still have superconductivity and uh, strange metal. So these are the three samples that we measured. So uh, one NDLSCO and two LSCO samples with different quality. So LSCO S2 and S1. And uh, this, the measure of quality for us in this case is uh, the residual resistivity. So when you have a higher residual resistivity, you have more disorder in the system. And when you have lower residual resistivity, you have a cleaner sample and a less disorder. And so uh, these are two LSCO samples. They are all at uh, doping of 0.24. And there is one NDLSCO sample in between with, uh, with a cleanness that is in between of these two samples. So in this measurement first, uh, we use this field configuration. We applied, uh, we have, we measured single crystals. We applied current in plane and we applied the field out of plane. So if you can imagine the copper oxide planes like that, we uh, put the, the current, the electric current was in plane and the field was out of plane. So in these uh, three samples, this is the uh, resistivity measurement as a function of magnetic field. For different isotherms, we started from 100 uh, Kelvin down to sorry down to uh, four Kelvin for uh, three different samples, and uh, this is the experimental setup. 
And uh, what we see is that at high temperature, resistivity scales as B square, which is uh, normal as it's uh, supposed to be. And at low temperature, it evolves to a perfectly T linear resistivity. So uh, in this work, we chose two samples. So for NDLS2 in particular, it has a relatively low, low TC. The TC was below 20 Kelvin. And uh, as we are, uh, we measured a sample with a lower TC at low temperature, we had access to a very wide range of uh, normal state. So this is, uh, you can oppose that, you can compare that with previous work. So in the measurement of LSCO with doping of uh, 0.18 and 19, uh, these, the same measurements were carried out, but they had access to a smaller uh, field range. And in other samples, in other uh, cuprates, Talium 2201 or BISCO, uh, high field measurements was uh, were carried on on samples with uh, lower TC, but these measurements didn't go to very high fields. So this is uh, the experimental work. And just for uh, the purpose of simplicity, I uh, plot the relative magneto resistance. So I normalize uh, rho B over rho of zero. So rho of zero is the value of uh, resistivity at low temperatures, at uh, zero field, sorry. And as you can see for four Kelvin, uh, we have a perfectly B linear resistivity, which evolves to be uh, to quadratic field dependence at uh, higher uh, temperatures. And uh, so this was uh, this is the first experimental observation. We uh, saw a, an evolution from B linear resistivity to B square. The second observation was that in these three samples that we measured with three different uh, disorder levels, at uh, four samples with higher highest quality, we saw the highest uh, magneto resistance. And by decreasing the uh, by uh, increasing the disorder uh, level the magneto resistance decreased. So all of these isotherms were uh, measured at the same temperature. And this is uh, another experimental observation. The third experimental observation was uh, to investigate different direction of the magnetic field. So uh, in, our, in the measurements that I showed you so far, we had the field was applied uh, parallel to the C axis. So out of the copper oxide planes, and uh, this is where we saw a sizable in-plane, uh, the sizable magneto resistance for such field configuration. We also applied the field in-plane uh, parallel to the current direction, and we saw very negligible magneto resistance. So these are this is the recap of uh, three experimental observations. We saw a B-linear to uh, B-squared uh, resistivity magneto resistance uh, by increasing the temperature. Uh, we observed that magneto resistance decreases by increasing the impurity, and we saw a negligible magneto resistance for field in play. So now let's try to uh, understand the data by uh, modeling. So uh, this the NDLS2 sample that we used, we consider that to be a unique playground for studying uh, resistivity, studying different electronic properties of this system, in a sense that on a closely related sample, actually on a sample that was cut from the same uh, mother sample, ADMR measurement, angle dependent magneto resistance measurements uh, were carried out. Uh, this project was led by uh, Gael with a collaboration with Brad Ramshaw Group, Cornell. And uh, basically in these ADMR measurements, the current was applied out of plane. So parallel to the C axis and the sample was rotated uh, as a function of uh, in different direction, different angle, in a uh, constant field. So the background field was 40, was 45 Tesla in all of these measurements, and different isotherms of resistivity was uh, measured. So uh, by using, uh, uh, they also, they, uh, they have two assumptions in their models, uh, the geometry of the Fermi surface, uh, that at 24%, it's a, a large uh, Fermi pocket, for uh, that they use, so that it was also observed by ARPES. And another assumption is the scattering rate. They use a very simple scattering model. So uh, this is scattering, uh, they use the model in which scattering has two parameters, has two uh, characteristics. One of them is completely isotropic scattering around across the Fermi surface, plus an anisotropic term that peaks around the antinodes. So around the antinodes, the scattering rate is uh, anisotropic. Around the uh, nodal direction, it's uh, isotropic. This is, again, the second uh, assumption. So 
by assuming this Fermi surf this uh, scattering rate model and this Fermi surface topology uh, and fitting the data so fitting the data is also uh, it's a relatively complicated uh, process because we have they had to fit all of these features as a function of temperature and uh, by doing that uh, basically isotropic and anisotropic scattering rate uh, was ex ex extracted so uh, in this study, uh, one of the conclusion of this study was that an isotropic scattering rate is elastic and it's temperature independent. Secondly, the isotropic scattering rate is telinear. So uh, this was uh, the bigger, uh, biggest message of this paper. And this isotropic scattering rate happens to uh, have this uh, Planckian dissipation. And the, the slope here, the slope of this line, is about uh, 1.2. So uh, based on this study, we think that uh, the scattering rate, this sc especially uh, the isotropic scattering rate is what sets uh, the telinear resistivity. And then the question of uh, what sets this isotropic uh, scattering rate is another question. Uh, but okay, armed with this data, with uh, anisotropic scattering rate with a scattering rate of the same material that we studied and using the Boltzmann transport, which is a semi-classical model. So we use Chambers formula that is a derivative of the Boltzmann transport. We revisited our data. So again, I remind you, these are uh, the experimental data and uh, we uh, use the same ADMR model to uh, predict, to see what one expects for the magneto resistance. So the question is, what is the origin of the anisotropic scattering rate? And uh, I think it, one of the origin of uh, this anisotropic scattering rate could be, for example, uh, as this is uh, so as this anisotropic scattering rate is elastic, we think that it might be re uh, related to the disorder and defects in the system. Uh, the question was that uh, if the anisotropic scattering rate is related to the uh, uh, Disorder level of the system, you expect that it changes as a function of uh, fit in different samples with different qualities. And uh, I go back to, to that later. Yes. So it looks like a universal number, right? So where the uh, where the feeling is seen or interactions? Where the interactions? Yeah, like if you if you look at the phase diagram, right? So so the it should it should have somehow go to the firm liquid. Because if you change feeling, right? So where the is it alpha? This alpha sensitive to the feeling? Or? No, no, no. So that is uh, another thing. So that is actually one of the uh, message of this discovery. The scattering rate has no field dependence in this study. And actually, question was feeling. The feeling or field? Ah, okay, feeling. feeling. Sorry, Not sorry. Field. <laughs> what is my feeling about uh, alpha? <laughs> <laughs> The filling depends, the doping depends. I see. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, in, a, in the phase diagram, this alpha, if you go to the right, we have, we are going to Fermi liquid. Yes. So, in the Fermi liquid phase, it's quadratic. So, what is the crossover between linear and quadratic is it is uh no what do you see experimentally yes yes we see that experimentally yes sure there, there is but it's a crossover it's not a transition this is what we considered in the regime where we have actually perfectly telinear resistivity so you know where resistivity is quadratic we don't consider that regime but uh i think in the old days they were fitting alpha t plus b t square i don't know if you still do this but well, maybe, that's right yeah. That's what was done many years ago, right, Gaia? Well, let me also show you something here, maybe. Okay, so just here, this is, uh, you know, how we see the transition. So at in this regime, in the uh, red part of the phase diagram, this is for cuprates, for LSCO. This is where we have T linear resistivity. And as you go higher in doping, so resistivity evolves to... Uh, T squared. So this is where we have a Fermi liquid. 
Right. Yeah. So it's a very good question again. Um, and it's kind of something we are investigating, but uh, I think we have uh, intuition, let's say. So the, the way we understand it um, is that alpha doesn't change as a function of doping, but the scattering rate, which is uh, linear in temperature, becomes momentum dependent. So so right now, if we go back, uh, I mean, as I mean, it's a very surface, it's, I don't know. I don't know what is 10 plus. But when you have perfectly linear resistivity, no T-square at all, everywhere on the Fermi surface, or for, in all directions of momentum, the scattering rate has the same value, and it has this uh, KBT over H bar, whatever, and with alpha equal one. But as you move towards a region where the resistivity becomes T plus T square, it's not that your alpha, indeed the T linear slope decreases, but it's not that your alpha goes down, is that regions of the Fermi surface now become T square. So it's like you don't have everywhere in all directions of momentum, you have your, your, your T linear resistivity with alpha equal one. Mm. You only keep, t, uh, I don't know, I can't point, but if you point in the, in the antinodal directions on the Fermi surface, no, on Fermi surface down there. Oh, okay. So what, what happens is that there's another material that has been studied a lot, which is thallium 2201, another cuprate. In this material, you have T plus T square. What they found is that in the antinodal direction, show I mean, is that, please. I mean, is that, um, in the antinodal direction of the Fermi surface, there you have T linear resistance. You have a sorry, you have a T linear scattering rate with alpha equal one, but in the antinodal in the nodal direction. You have a t square resist. You have a t square scattering rate. So you end up that you don't have any more um, an isotropic t linear scattering rate. The only portions. So what I mean is that alpha stays alpha equal one, but regions where alpha equal one just disappear. It stays universal. There's no tweaking uh, of uh, of the slope of the scattering rate. Just it disappears uh, in momentum in some regions of momentum space. No, the slope in the resistivity, it, yeah, in the resistivity is going to go down. But if you try to extract where, where the scattering comes from, you realize that just the regions where it's linear just disappear slowly on the Fermi surface. Thank you, Gail. Uh... Okay, so now the, the other question that we tried to address was that uh, what is, what sets? this uh, uh, bilinear resistivity. So uh, in the data that I showed you, in the data that we uh, used uh, scattering rate that was extracted from, sorry, uh, in the data that I showed you earlier, that was uh, in which we used the scattering rate from ADMR data, we saw a perfectly bilinear resistivity, well, in the range in which we carried out these measurements. For your information, eventually it will saturate at high enough field. Uh, but the question was that what, under what, which uh, circumstances this bilinear resistivity uh, would disappear? And to answer to this question, we uh, redid the calculations and we turned off this anisotropic uh, component of the scattering rate. And there, uh, this bilinear resistivity was disappeared. So this is, uh, again, another uh, observation that came out of the modeling, that what sets this bilinear resistivity is the anisotropic scattering rate. So now uh, back to the question of uh, how we can understand this uh, magnetoresistance for samples with different disorder levels. So uh, we try to uh, fit the data again. And uh, as it was uh, very well actually uh, guessed, what controls this uh, different levels of this magnetoresistance, what uh, controls the magnetoresistance is the elastic, is temperature independent elastic scattering rate. So simply by using a prefactor C and doing the rest of the calculation uh, with uh, the parameters that uh, came out of the ADMR measurements, we were able to account for this magnetoresistance qu uh, quantitatively. So by uh, this is for uh, NDLSCO with uh, the prefactor C1. And uh, if you reduce the impact of this uh, elastic temperature independent elastic scattering rate, you can reproduce what was observed in the clean sample. And if you increase this prefactor, you can also observe what was, uh, you can uh, reproduce what was observed in a sample with uh, lower quality. Uh, and last uh, but not least, this is still a, an open question. So uh, 
with our uh, model, as, as I showed you this experimental data before, we observed no in-plane magnetoresistance. And uh, by uh, using our model, by using uh, Boltzmann transport with the scattering rate that we had, this is also what was uh, reproduced. So we saw a uh, sizable uh, field, uh, field dependent magnetoresistance for B parallel to C, where the current was in plane, and we saw close to uh, no or negligible uh, magnetoresistance when field was parallel to current. So uh, this is again the the last observation, but which this is which is uh, completely trivial. So you don't expect it because there is no uh, Lorentz force when you apply the field in the direction of the current. But uh, this is something that we observed uh, with our uh, uh, model, and uh, that is what we've seen in our data. So why we even uh, bother to measure such a trivial uh, configuration of field? So uh, recently, it was observed that uh, when you actually apply field in plane in the direction of the uh, current, you can see an uh, you know a sizable magnetoresistance for the system that Gael measure, uh, mentioned before, so thallium 2201. So in this system, uh, the puzzle and the open question is that uh, it's very large in-plane magnetoresistance, almost at the with the same uh, size for the out-of-plane uh, field magnetoresistance was observed in this system. And uh, this is a question that uh, should be addressed. Maybe it depends on the peculiarities of the Fermi surface or uh, the scattering rate that is uh, different in this system. And another question that, uh, another thing that is still uh, an open question is that what controls the telinear resistivity and the scattering rate? So the sc when you have a t perfectly telinear resistivity. And one of the curious cases is that, for example, in these samples in thallium 2201, in samples that are extremely clean, you have a very nice, perfectly telinear resistivity. But if you apply, uh, if you, uh, extrapolate this uh, telinear resistivity, it goes to negative values. So now the question is uh, how, when you apply sufficiently enough magnetic field for, in order to suppress the superconductivity completely here, you have to apply a very large field. So uh, the question is how it will evolve and uh, what would be the, uh, what would be the temperature at which this magnetoresistance changes course, for example. Would it stay telinear all the way to zero or it changes course? So uh, with that, I would uh, like to conclude my presentation. So we observed, uh, we showed that Boltzmann transport can model the bilinear magnetoresistance. We uh, showed that Boltzmann, with Boltzmann transport, we can account for the transition from bilinear to B squared uh, resistivity. We showed that there is no, uh, in plane uh, magnetoresistance for the direction of field in plane, at least in these systems, in LSCO and in the LSCO uh, Coupre superconductors. And uh, we saw that uh, we showed again that the scattering rate doesn't have a field uh, dependence. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Anir, for this talk. Um, a very short question about what you said last. Uh, why is it surprising to have a sizable magnetic resistance when B is parallel to yeah to, to current? I mean, it just I mean, why would you expect it to be zero? Negative? Yeah, because of the Lorentz because of the uh, Lorentz force. So you know, when you apply field, usually when you know it's out of uh, plane, it should yeah, be out sure. uh, in the uh, direction perpendicular to the current. Yes, but I mean, there if, you have. If you think classically, you you would have some kind of electrical trajectory there. So, so the electrons are still moving, they can still scatter a lot, even though they don't scatter due to the Zen motion, they could scatter uh, much more if they do this uh, helical motion, it seems, I mean, naively. Yes, but this, usually this produces very, very negligible magnetoresistance. So, you know, and this magnetoresistance would be for sure much smaller than the other direction of the field. But what is surprising, what is very surprising is that actually this magnetic resistance was comparable to what was observed for field out of play. So I agree with you, this helical motion, but this is this gives you very small magnetic resistance. Yes. Yeah, so I have a question. So normally you can scale uh, for a regular metal or for regular metals, you can scale all the resistivities by the divide temperature. What happens if you take 
your high TC data and scale it onto that plot. Would one see a difference? One should, no? So the question is, uh, what we see when we scale this with the Debye temperature? Yeah. So if you have a, an early plot where you scale all the resistivity with the Debye temperature out of the book from uh, the, who's the guy with the transistor? Yeah. No, no, Kittel. Uh, Ashcroft. I think Ash, no, no, the Bardeen. It's out of the book of Bardeen. So if you go back all the way. Maybe you're talking about this. Yeah, the one on the right there. Yeah, that one. So if you scale your data onto that, what how does that look like? Because you see the horizontal axis here is T over theta device. So what happens in the... Yeah, but theta device is known for the high TCs. Pretty sure. Yeah. So you can certainly do the scaling. It's the same. It's all copper oxide. Yeah, I mean it, it you know. It, it, this would obviously show you that you're not just looking at phonons, no? It should be different. I think so. It deviates. I think it deviates from this line, and it's, it should be somewhere here because of uh, so first these uh, the Debye the temperature for these typical metals are of the order of 200, 300 Kelvin or so. For cuprates, I think it's much higher. It's 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 low. It's also around four hundred T Debye. Okay, so if you put the uh, cuprates here, it would also follow this line, you think? No, no, I, I, I would expect it not to follow this line. Yeah, that, would... that is what I expect also. But uh, I don't know exactly it goes which way, this way or the, that way. I was thinking if the DY temperature is higher, it might go this way. But uh, this is something that we should think more about. But for sure, it doesn't follow this line. Yeah, thank you. I have a question too. Uh... Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. So it, you had a, a slide where you had a, a phase diagram with the um, temperature and magnetic fields, where you kind of extended the uh, the phase diagram of where you have a linear um, dependence. Um, and my question is, uh, what I seems to be getting from your data is that as you apply a magnetic fields, you decrease the range of where you see linear resistivity. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, let, let me uh, go to the slide. Yes, so uh, you are talking about this. So for example, if you say that here, there is a range in which resistivity is uh, T linear, while we are uh, decreasing the temperature, this T linear uh, range would be larger and larger. That's is it. The question? Yes. Yes. So yeah, that is actually we tried like many many different fittings uh, on this data. But uh, if you if you want to fit the data uh, with like a different, there's the two carrier model in which it invokes both B linear and B square resistivity. Uh, yes, you are right. You can. Uh, use that model to uh, uh, fit the data. But here in our uh, models, we wanted to stick to what is known and what is uh, unknown. So basically all of these uh, models, all of these fittings are either completely bilinear or quadratic. But the, the, from experimental point of view, your observation is correct. That is uh, what happens. Uh, the range of bilinear resistivity increases by decreasing the temperature. But then uh, in our uh, model, it doesn't have any uh, particular significance. But in a uh, multiple carrier model, yes, it has some. It, that is uh, introduced by Nigel Hussey. They make some conclusion out of that. But from experimental point of view, that is true. Yes, this the range of T-linear resistivity becomes larger and larger at low temperature. Okay, a, thank you. Is it okay, Michel? Wait. Uh, Okay, there's another question online by Pierre Olivier. Yes. Hello. Um, oh. I was wondering uh, about uh, the T-linear resistivity with uh, the magnetic field. Um, why do you need to get to such a low temperature to, to get this linear resistivity since when you're uh, not using a um the magnetic field and only the, the temperature the range is very high in temperature 
Like, what is your feeling about this? So the question is why we have to go to low temperatures in order to see this uh, bilinear resistivity? Yeah, like knowing that uh, when you don't change the the, uh, the magnetic field, you, you can get to very high temperature and still have your linear uh, resistivity. I see. Okay, I see. I see the question. So, uh, yeah, the thing is, if we go to like a higher temperature, as uh, Michel also alluded to, we have the combination of B linear or B squared resistivity. But if you want to see a perfectly B linear resistivity, you have to go to a low temperature. Usually, this is uh, when you don't want to have any mix uh, mixing with uh, quadratic field uh, quadratic uh, field dependence, and. Uh, why it is it happens at low temperature? So first of all, we don't think that there is anything significant for a B linear resistivity, because as I mentioned in our calculation, it is only uh, the matter of uh, how much uh, field, how much uh, what is the field range you have access to. So at sufficiently enough field, so all of these measurements were done up to like eighty five tesla, as you can see here, but if uh, with calculation we can apply as much field as we want. And if uh, you go to high enough fields, actually this T linear resistivity, this B linear resistivity also changes course. It is, it stops to be uh, linear. So that is what I wanted to highlight and stress here is that there is nothing significant about that, even at low temperature. It's the question of how much field you have access to. And if you go to high enough field, you can, have, you can see a saturation and the crossover to B quadratic field as you can see this is this is what uh, our model tells us thank you so the answer to your question another version of the another temperature version temperature of the question is from uh, from patrick is that at high temperature the magneto resistance is very small because because there's there's that of other phono, because other phonon yes hmm. Right. At very high temperature, the scattering rate is so large that the, the, you don't have much time to change direction. Yes. Uh, other qu questions? Yes, just a second. There's no question. Um, another question on the regular materials. Um, the fact that you observe a, a linear dependence of resistivity uh, uh, versus temperature in, I don't know, uh, copper or gold is, um, as far as I understand, not specific to phonons. If I have a Fermi liquid coupled to bosons, any kind of bosons, I expect in some temperature range, a linear dependence of the resistivity, right? So I was wondering if there yes. are some examples of materials where the scattering is dominated by, I don't know, spin fluctuations, I don't know, anti ferromagnets or anti-ferromagnets, where the linear temperature dependence is observed. Because here it's, it's phonons, but it could be any other boson, I think. Right. So as for the example, for example, uh, for the particular case of uh, spin fluctuations, you asked, your question was that if a spin fluctuation can give you B linear uh, resistivity. It's. Uh, I'm, I'm here talking about temperature. Okay, as a function of temperature. Yes. Talking about. Uh, yes. So I I think that would be that's a very good question uh, for uh, theorists. So where you have. I was wondering if there are some observations. I think theorists uh, tell me I'm not if I'm wrong, but you expect this T linear for any boson, right? You don't care about which boson. So are there materials where the boson is not the phonon, but I don't know, another one, like spin fluctuations in an electromagnet? Do so, you know if there are some examples of materials where linear resistance, resistivity has been observed? In the antiferromagnetic phase. In, 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 due to, due to antiferromagnetic fluctuation, for example. Due to antifero. That's a, that's a very good question. Actually, so it is, if I were to guess, for example, basically in cuprates, uh, here at this is the end point of the pseudo gap. This is the foot of the pseudo gap, and uh, at this point, there are based on some uh, th theoretical works. You have 
uh, you know, uh, antiferromagnetic fluctuation. So there could be the end point of the spin density wave. So at low temperatures, uh, at a low uh, lower uh, dopings, you have antiferromagnetic phase. But here, it it is the end point of the pseudo gap. So maybe it could be also uh, it could give rise to this uh, bilinear resistivity. But well, the ionic tides are even better, right? I mean, the, it's the, yes, yeah, it's actually this is a spin density wave. Yes, yeah, that's a very good spin density wave. So at the end of this, yeah, the boson must be. Yeah, yes, but if you, um, you know, it depends where is this, uh, the, the, the characteristic spin fluctuation frequency at uh, 25 degrees or something, you know, when the linear resistivity starts, right? I mean, at the quantum critical point, it should be, uh, should be zero, okay, if equivalent having theta divided of zero. Yeah, any boson can do it. Yeah, it has to be gapless or to have a temperature that's lower than lower than the uh, higher than the mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the so Nicola is uh, remarking that cerium rhodium medium five seems to this is antiferromagnetic phase also and so yes. have uh, here the the linear is uh, in the green colors and. Yes. You have an antiferromagnetic phase that ends that. Yes. Another question, I guess, a lot of Sherbrooke uh, <laughs> activity here. I'm, I'm going to check online. Yeah, no, there is no question. I, uh, just to say, uh, I don't know any observation, I don't know any material where you have an ordered phase because here we're talking about, I think your question addresses like a boson. Say you have magnons, so you would be in an ordered phase and you have gapless magnons. I don't know any materials where you see general resistivity uh, in the ordered phase. Here we are seeing uh, it's always next to the ordered phase, never in the ordered phase that you see general resistivity. Then, I mean, I think in cuprates people discuss like paramagnons. I don't know how you define that, that you're in the in regions where you don't have a static order. And you might still have uh, short range magnons or something like that living. And maybe that's the reason why there's still a resistivity in these materials. But it's always in proximity to an ordered phase, never in the ordered phase. I think in the pnictides, when it becomes a, a spin density wave, it's not, I mean, it's not linear anymore. Uh, it might still be a metal, right? It's still a metal in the pnictides. In the cuprates, it's an insulator when you enter the antiferromagnetic phase. So you never see tilin resistivity when you have long range order. Uh, and I don't know any other bosons that give you tilin resistivity. Yes, once you're in this uh, ordered phase, uh, there's a general theorem that doesn't come to my mind, but uh, that uh, the goldstone bosons uh, don't, don't uh, scatter with uh, electrons. I mean, at least at, at, at the wave vector of the Goldstone boson, you don't scatter out of the, you know, in other words, you remember the name of this theorem? You Adler theorem or something, I forget. So once you have the order, you don't want the scattering to destroy this order. And it stays. so it's a question of matrix elements, basically, I think. Okay, more questions? Um, just the last question. It's the um, this this anisotropic uh, uh, elastic scattering. Uh, that part that is uh, anisotropic and supposedly elastic. What's the origin of that? At uh, uh, you know, impurity scattering in my mind is basically isotropic. Okay, it's kind of the first approach. So. How can you get something, and that's pretty large actually. So how can you get something anisotropic that much coming from this or, or actually triggered by disorder? How impurity can give something like that? I'm not sure if the mechanism is not. Because, well, I would I would guess if it's because of density but, of states. You but see, the, yeah, very large density of states at the uh, at the anti-node because of anode singularity. Right, yes, that's that's a good. So that's a possibility. Uh, so, Gael, does it correspond to what you think? Or? Can it exacerbate the impurity exa 
As I guess that's what we wrote in the paper indeed is yeah. that uh, in this particular material, you're right at the, at almost at the van of singularity of this edge or the edges of the Fermi surface that have very large density of state. And uh, as far as I know, there are, there are papers that explain that small Q scattering is expected to be very anisotropic uh, in, in the cube rates when you're close to the, to, to the, to the Van Hove. So in principle, it's really because of the density of state, as Jean-René said. But it, it doesn't mean it's universal. It just means that for LSCO and the LSCO, when you have telinear resistivity, you're really at the Van Hove singularity. And therefore, for the for these materials, it makes sense. For talium two two one, you don't have an anisotropic sketch for the for the elastic uh, component, yeah, because you are very far from a Van Hove singularity. Okay, sorry for the online people. We all get excited here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, Mirza, for this very nice uh, talk. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.